Hi, my name is Ailish McKeown from Blackrock, County Loud in Ireland, and I have written chapter 14. It's about Laura, who wanted to achieve her dream job of becoming a community health nurse, and through the use of conversational intelligence and the five brains, she achieved it. In chapter 16, I talk about Judith and Richard's trip to Ireland, how they landed on Irish soil on the 10th of September 2017, and how I watched this lady operate and how she was keynote speaker at several events. And I spent time with her outside of those events and getting to know and understand who Judith was as a person and the love that Richard and her shared. I also noted that this lady her dream was to get conversational intelligence out to the world. And that was her life's purpose. And from she was 14 years old, she had that dream and she was achieving it. And sadly, she has passed on November 2018 and we all miss her. But we are still spreading our word through changing conversations in a changing world. My name is Deborah Goldstein, and I am honored to not only host today's regulars table, but to be part of the Converse, the CIQ European Collective. And although it says European Collective, I do want to note that we uh, represent Europe, the Americas, Asia, and Africa within our collective. And as part of the collective, 15 of my awe-inspiring colleagues each wrote a chapter as a case study in this, this, oh, it's not that clear, but it's um, our Changing Conversations for a Changing World book. And it's a fascinating book, and I'm not being partial here, but it's a fascinating book because it's, it's stories, real case studies of these 15 coaches talking about how they applied conversational intelligence and how it affected both their business life and their personal life. So think about looking at the application of conversational intelligence from so many different perspectives is pretty special. And today we're gonna to be speaking specifically about Eilish's two chapters, um, chapter 14, which is helping clients dream come true with the conversational intelligence toolbox and chapter 16, which is titled in memory of my dearest friend, mentor, colleague, Judith E. Glazer. Now, this is a symbolic regulars table. Usually we spend our time really dissecting the case studies. Sonia grabbed hers just now, that's very nice to see. Um, we, we usually spend the hour dissecting the case studies and really allowing the authors to dig into the case studies. But today, as you heard on the trailer, um, tomorrow we'll, we'll commemorate the third year of Judith's passing. So this regulars table is gonna be a bit different than the others. And we are so, pleased and honored that Richard Glazer has joined us for today's session. So today what we're going to be doing is having some conversation with, um, with both Ailish and Richard that will cover both chapters, but really show a little bit of Judith as a person, Judith as a partner, and Judith, who is definitely the, the thread that has kept us all together all of these years later. So that is our program for today, and I'd like to start by sharing with, um, with you a question. Um, for those of you who um, are part of the conversational intelligence community, I'm kind of curious about what you thought Judith's superpower was. Anybody who met her, who read anything of hers, who heard her speak, must have been moved by this amazing woman. And I'm wondering if you'd be generous enough to share in the chat box what you thought Judith's superpower was. What really struck you as you got to um, know Judith? Anybody have a sense? Sonia says Judith's superpower was curiosity. Yeah. Rosary says, oh, great to, great to see everybody. Um, Tanya says her attentiveness to every nuance. Linda says connection. Oh uh, yeah, Charlotte, she was absolutely present in every moment. I couldn't have said that better. 
Warmth. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I feel the warmth right now in this Zoom room, thanks to the connection that we all feel for Judith. Now, I wanted to share with you what I think of my, of Judith's, um, Judith's power was listening to connect and to understand. And I learned this very early on. I actually met Judith when her first book came out. Oh, excuse me. It was not her first book. That was, that was a faux pas. She's met, read, met, written many books, but the conversational intelligence book. And I had met her, unbe I didn't know about the book, but I met her at a networking event and she invited me for coffee or tea. So I was able to, to visit her in her apartment in Richard's, Richard and Judith's apartment on Central Park South. And it was remarkable how curious she was about me. I was a nothing. I was just a, a person that she met at a networking event. And Judith was so curious and asked such great questions. And I could feel her connecting with me. And then in the middle of our talk, the phone rang. And I, I don't remember if it was specifically about the interviews she did with Fran Tarkington, who um, is a football, was a football quarterback, and I love the, the Vikings, or it was somebody from a TV show, and she was so incredibly gracious and apologetic with me to say, please excuse me, and I'll be right back. And I was so touched that this woman was interested and connected to somebody that she'd never even met. And once she finished that phone call, she was right back there with me. It was one of the most memorable interactions I've ever experienced. And I've got a lot of decades under my belt of connection and conversations. So having shared that, um, Eilish, I would love to um, hear from you about how Judith, Judith listened to connect and listen to understand. Yeah, I suppose uh, those of us who studied with Judith, we understand the five conversational intelligence and the alchemy of conversation. But I thought our true gift was listening. You know, when you really listen, she reminds me of being almost like on her way to being a Dalai Lama. She was so good at that. She made you feel you were the only person in the world. But uh, one at an ICF Ireland event, we had... Um, a senior manager there, David O'Grady. And David, um, I noticed in the break at lunchtime that Judith and uh, David were deep in conversation. And then on the evaluation later on that, uh, in a week or two, David submitted an evaluation to say that he had a real problem with a gr leadership group he was meeting. And guess what Judith did? She asked him a question. And one of the essentials is, ask questions for which you have no answers, which, I mean, if we all did that, we'd be listening. So she, 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 he said she helped him reframe, refocus and redirect his issue. And then he said that he went on to have that meeting on the Friday and that it was the best meeting ever. And he really learned an awful lot from her. So she took the time to do, I noticed her doing that during that day's event. And I know Rosari's on the call here and she set up a lot of our events with me. And um, we were witness to that quite a bit that week, you know. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can feel that and from the, the chapter in the book, it really comes through and resonates. So I'm curious if Richard would be, Richard, would you be willing to share? Was Judith always a great listener? <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. She never listened to me. Um, <laughs> she, the answer is she was very curious about everybody and she really liked to find out about people and so I, I used to tease her I said you, you, you're you unable to talk to give a declarative sentence everything was a question and, and then you had to break the code so for example one question would be why are you turning here? Which means you idiot, you've made the wrong turn. Um, so once I understood the code, I was able to, I was able to navigate with Judy. But Judy was a, she just liked people and she was interested in learning. Um, and I think Judy had a number of careers and I think it all played together in, in creating conversational intelligence. Um, um, she majored in early child development um, when she was in college as an undergraduate. 
And I always told her that's why she got around along with CEOs so easily. Um, and then, and then she went into and she became very big into anthropology and did on an anthropological dig. And she really regarded herself as an anthropologist. And she loved, she loved the way societies and groups perform. And what was Judy's sweet spot was working with large, large companies or large corporations or groups. She just felt that that was, that was terrific. And she considered herself a corporate anthropologist. And so from anthropology and just a curiosity of how things work, she, at one time, she was a terrific um, artist and then just moved on from that. And then she decided she'd pick up classical guitar. Once she mastered that, she moved on from that. But the one thing that she really stayed with was, was conversations and conversations. Mm. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I loved all of that texture. My favorite part was um, about the never listening to you because I don't, although that is humorous, I know that that is absolutely not true. One of the things I appreciate is how the two of you were really so supportive and loving and together. It's, it's, it, for me, it was a, it's a lesson in my life about how to be a great partner. So thank you for sharing all of that, Richard. I'm also, I've always been amazed at how Judith's body of work was so immense. There's so much to conversational intelligence. And I, I was part of the, um, the class of 2017, and I'm still finding things and reviewing things. And Leslie Hamilton brought to our um, mastermind a couple of weeks ago, a tool I had forgotten about. Judith's body of work was immense. The practical tools went wide and deep. And Eilish, I'm curious, uh, because you were in the graduation class of 2016, the first graduation class, what was your favorite tool? Could I just say I'm very bored because I'm typing. <laughs> Ute, uh, Erika and Pat are trying to get in and they're not Thank getting you. I'm taking care of it right now as we speak. So <laughs> sorry, I'm very on, your, on, your, on your time, I will take. So I'll tell you my piece anyway, because um, and Richard checked me out on this. The five brains we learned in 2016, and then that became the six brains because we added in the gut brain. But Judith had been working on that for quite some time. So I had uh, I had been doing career coaching, and. A girl came to me, she was a theatre nurse in a private hospital in Dublin, travelling three hours a day, wanted to get on the national programme for public health nursing, which would allow her to work in the community. And she had done an interview the previous year and she there was 300 candidates and she didn't succeed. So she came to me and uh, I asked her, how did that interview go? What happened? And as soon as she explained it, I understood, you know, if we know the brain and how it works, and most of us know, even if we didn't do a conversational intelligence about the amygdala hijack. So she was asked a question and she kept giving the same answer and they kept looking at her and she kept looking back and she was getting more, you know, so it didn't work for her. So I started to explain to her about the, the brain and how it works and that if she could calm that amygdala and that's where distrust lies, she would have the whole of our brain at her disposal, which is what we were learning in conversational intelligence. And that the neocortex has the library of all the information she has and her limbic brain, all the building relationships. But the one thing in particular I explained was about the prefrontal cortex here and that we communicate with one another in pictures and we communicate with one another by telling stories. And I also said to her, you know, the interview board have brains as well and that they have the same brain and they, even though you might not realize that they could have fear they could have different things happening to them and I was saying if you could communicate with them when they ask you a question in a story formulate your answers in stories and tell them in stories and pictures and so she went off and that was three hours and she came back for another three hours and we rehearsed it good news is she contacted me she came number 24 on the panel out of 300 and she got a job locally 
So she no longer had to go to the city. So she studied and she completed her course a year later. And I sent Judith the picture of her holding up her new baby boy one year later graduating. So that was a fabulous dream come true through conversational intelligence. And her case study is up on, you know, has always been there. It's been on uh, WBEX, it's been on YouTube, you know. Mm. That was a good and, news story. And so you you are um, you use the six brains, the five brains turn to the six brains with um, your your client. And is that truly your favorite tool, Ailish? Well you see, that was one of the first we got, and I loved it. I, I, people were going on about other things, but that was something that I loved. I loved that. I loved the dashboard. I have, they are probably my two favorite, and the dashboard, as we know, is about listening to connect and how we, you know, we create cortisol in our body when we don't listen to connect. We become more protective of ourselves, and as we move across the dashboard, we go towards. Uh, sharing and truth telling and walking together with one another so those are my two favorites mm. so i'm curious for those of you who are on the call today who are familiar with conversational intelligence if you would share in the chat box what your favorite tool was and i'm so curious because there were so many dozens of tools and i'm wondering if there's going to be a lot of similarities or it's going to be splattered all over the place so what was your favorite tool your favorite lesson, your favorite concept with conversational intelligence. Erica says, definitely the dashboard is at the top of the list. Yeah, Linda says trust and the dashboard. Karina says the ladder of conclusions are the three levels of conversations. Yeah, and Erica, doesn't Ailish look amazing? She she was at the beauty parlor this morning, just between us. <laughs> well, just for the hair, not for the face. <laughs> Conversation. My own work. The face is my own work. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm seeing a lot of um, a lot of similarities and. Tanya had mentioned my favorite, which is 1010 partnering. I find that that is such an easy and and accessible tool for both work and life. I'm very, I'm a big fan of the 1010 partnering for life. It very much reminds me of the, um, the five, the five, the five love languages by Chapin. So Richard, I'm curious, I don't want to put you on the spot because I'm sure that Judith's tools were somewhat like ch people's children. They love them all for different reasons. I'm curious if you would say a couple of words about what Judith's favorite tool may have been. Oh, it's very interesting. Um, the evolution of how those came about. Um, they came about because Ben Croft wanted tools to give out in the programs. Judith never used tools. And so, and as I said, Judith was an artist. And so there was a, you know, she would just design what she did. And then we worked with a lovely woman by the name of Roxanne Pinero, who puts the panache on what Judy and she would come up with. And so Judy was very enamored by how nice everything looked as well. Um, but it's interesting how the, the tools have changed. Uh, the use of the tools have changed. Judith would use them as a leave behind, that she would work directly with a client or with a team or with a, a group and use them as a leave behind. And, um, but she never worked from them. She worked directly with a client. And I think things have evolved since then because I think the number of people use the tools up front and use it as a, as a way of entering into a client relationship, which is interesting the way things evolve. I think the same thing is true of the uh, Catalyst tools, uh, which some of you may or may not use. Um, some people use them now as a diagnostic to work with a client. And, and Judith had created them as a way of creating more business with an existing client. And that's why she called them catalyst tools. 
So after six months or a year, she would use, the, use one of those tools and say, we can see we need another six months here. And so it was really based on the business aspect of it. Um, I don't know if Judith had one favorite. Um, she liked the latter of conclusions. She liked the fact that she was very attuned to how people's beliefs uh, color how they how they interact. Okay. And she liked and she liked the, the latter of conclusions. I will say that after so many years, I think that I think the dashboard is the one that has gotten the biggest play. And in fact, one of the coaches we knew made a rug out of it so that when working with the teams, people could stand where they were. And, and the other thing was it, it's international. We had done work down in Buenos Aires and people picked that up right away. Um, it's, um, and in, in, in the work that we had done with some pharmaceutical companies in Europe and so forth, it, it's, it's those things, they're very universal. And, but I would say probably the latter of conclusions was, was one of Judith's favorites. Mm. And I think that the latter of conclusions and the dashboard, such amazingly complex thoughts and pro processes illustrated in such a simple way. I mean, uh, it's so easy, as you said, Richard, international, very easy to grasp onto, but you could go so deep with them. So I appreciate that those were her favorites. And I, I also appreciate that because of her curiosity and her ability to be present, double clicking always comes off to me as one of her favorite tools. I don't know if there was ever a, a, a sheet about double clicking, but correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. I feel like I feel like double clicking was definitely a, a tool that instantly became part of my repertoire. Instead of saying what, I would be able to come um, to, to get deeper and, and wider into a concept so easily because of that concept of double clicking. And I saw that Sonia um, picked up her mouse because well, I mean, it's such an easy, it's such a graspable concept. So Elish, I would love for you to share a little bit about double clicking and the fact that a few people in the chat box at the beginning mentioned that Judith was so present all the time. Yeah, and I, I think it was it Bob said that she likes the double clicking in Els Beta. That was one of their favorite tools. And like it was really, you know, when we all started to learn computers, and this is how Judith explained it, and you had the little yellow box. And in order to get into the box, you had to double click on it. And that's really the comparison she made. You double click on it. And when you double click, you have all this information inside that. And you can even click on that again. So it's like about drilling down. And that's something I would have done in career coaching. Uh, you know, you're, you're taught to, to funnel down. So what happened, we had the ICF conference and there was about... 100 attendees at it or more. Richard was there and uh, Judith was in the audience uh, sharing her stories with people and she was going over the five essentials. As I said, the, the title of it was The Alchemy of Conversation and the priming for trust, listening to connect, ask questions for which you have no answers um, and the reframe, refocus, redirect, and then the double clicking. So she, she asked any questions and this lady in the audience stood up and they were only about maybe three or four feet apart if they were. And she asked Judith a question and Judith was answering and then Judith stopped and she said, uh, what happened just then? And the woman was looking at her and she said, no, no, I saw something just happen. It was in your eyes, something like, and she could see that something happened in the brain and she was watching it. And the lady um, just stopped, paused and went over what it was. And I can't remember what that was, but I do remember vividly that happening. And she shared it. And, you know, it was, it was a major learning for her, I think. And that she was explaining the double clicking. So, um, yeah, that was just fabulous. I don't know, Richard, you probably don't remember that, but anyway. Yeah, I, think it, I, think it had, I think it had something to do with the, with the daughter. Uh, oh. it, was a, it was a family issue, I'm almost certain. Yeah. And, um, and that was not the first time yeah. that Judith, Judith had done something like that. She was very observant 
of of how people's postures and how how that changes in a conversation. And so um, she would just pick up on that. Um, so that was, you know, that's that's a perfect example of that. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I, I'll go on, Eilish. No, I was saying Karen is online here. Karen was at the, uh, Karen loves stories and I know she enjoyed Judith telling the stories, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, it was a great day. And I was just about to, um, because what you've just, both Ailish and Richard, what you've just said really resonates with me in that there's, in my mind, there is one thing about coaching, one-on-one, -on -one, you're, you're alone in a room or on a Zoom call together, one-on-one, -on -one. there's no other distraction. And then there's talking in a crowd. And I don't know about y'all, but when I do workshops, it's very difficult for me to absorb and to process and to engage all at the same time. And I think that that is one of Judah's superpowers as well. I remember being so awed and amazed when she had technical problems and sometimes Gertrude show up um, during, her, during her teaching and during the education and she was calm. She was, she kept her focus. She kept that really sharp way of understanding, asking questions, engaging with people. And I think that that's a talent that until Ailish and Richard, you just had this back and forth, I didn't recognize as really a difference between one-on-one -on -one coaching and maybe it's group facilitation, maybe it's presentations, workshops, but I'm going to, I'm going to journal about that tomorrow because it didn't come up in my brain until the two of you just uh, touched on that. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. so another area I would very much appreciate um, Ailish and Richard speaking about was um, conversational intelligence as it launched. Um, there are many of you, and I'm curious if you would either write in the chat box or raise your hand physically or with the reactions, who was in that first cohort? Who was in Ailish's cohort, which was in 2016? The cohort that launched on January 18th, 2017. I'm seeing Uta's hand, Charlotte's hand. I'm seeing Sonia and Barb. Oh, Karina's got the, um, Linda, okay. So a good many of you, of us, were there with that first cohort. And um, I was curious, you know, when Ailish and I have been prepping for this, preparing for this discussion, I was really curious about um, the start of conversational intelligence and that first cohort. And Ailish shared with me a very moving story. And Ailish, I was hoping that you would share it with us all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I first heard Judith uh, talk for WBEX and like she really, she held me spellbound. She talked about studying conversational intelligence for 50 years from she was very young. And uh, before the launch, uh, an email came out to tell us that something sacred would be shared on the day of the launch. And so when I heard that on the day of the launch, it was the 18th of January, 20, uh, 2016. So I lit three candles in my window and I live at the seaside and the tide was coming in and the sun was beaming down on the tide. And I was saying, I wonder what will this uh, sacred sharing be, you know? So Judith started off and she did say, now it wasn't Richard, I'm very sorry to tell you, it wasn't that it was our wedding anniversary, but it was our wedding anniversary <laughs> on the 18th of January. But she said um, that she'd had breast cancer some years before and that just, I think now Richard, you could say that just before Christmas, she discovered that she had pancreatic cancer. And I was kind of gobsmacked that this lady could launch conversational intelligence. I didn't really know her and that she was so upbeat about everything. And she carried on as if, you know, that wasn't the case. But it really, when I looked at the chat, uh, Lisa Knox, who was there at the time and Ben Croft, they said they had goosebumps on their necks when they heard I had three candles lit, but I just did that knowing it was something sacred and I had no idea what that was, but it was unbelievable and I always remember it. And unfortunately, 
two of my candles. I think the dog knocked them over. I have one, they sit in a little stand in my bedroom in the window and they always remind me of that day. And I was touched and moved by knowing that during that first cohort, the cohort itself was so supportive mm -hmm. and holding space for Judith this whole time as she was going through her, her treatments. And I'm just amazed that the whole time that she was bringing CIQ, Conversational Intelligence to the World, she was also managing her health and going through tedious processes, just tedious physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually in order to stay healthy. And Richard, I'm wondering how she did it. How was she able to bring CIQ to the world while she was doing her best to stay healthy? Um. I'll tell you a story. We used to go to Wild Cornell for chemotherapy. And Judith had a port installed because the infusion, we'd go to the infusion room and we'd, we'd be there for four hours every two weeks. We were the only people who would bring computers with us and sit and work for four hours during infusion. And the people used to make fun of us. They just couldn't believe it. Judy was either on the computer or on the phone and they had to say, you have to be quiet, you have to be quiet. And just she just did not acknowledge it. She just never spoke about it. She just kept on going. And I don't know if you, if you know or not, I didn't, one day I, I'm, we were somewhere, we were going to, I guess, a, a bar mitzvah. And I didn't like the way Judy looked. They call it medical terms, it's an affect. I didn't like her affect, it changed. And I called the oncologist and he said, come over immediately. And that, and that afternoon we had an MRI and um, we met with a surgeon and Judy had a brain tumor. The brain tumor was a little bit bigger than a walnut. And she was operated on the next morning. And that was in the midst of a flu epidemic and so we were like in the emergency room forever. We never could get a bed assigned to us. The next morning, Judy was operated on for a brain tumor. And she wakes up that afternoon and she's okay. The next day, the next day, she said, bring my computer in. And so she just worked. And then another day afterwards, we walked out of the hospital. And the only thing that bothered her was that through the chemo, she had lost her hair. And, um, and so <laughs> we had an array of wigs, we have a number of wigs. But she just, Judy just kept on going. She didn't, she didn't pay attention to it. It was just something else that she had to do, you know, had to deal with and that was it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but she just ignored it. It sounds like it was her mission to um, bring conversational intelligence to the world. And she loved to talk about conversational intelligence and creating we. Um, there were a number, a couple of Judy's. It's very interesting. Judy wrote a number of books, um, you know, creating we, the DNA of leadership, but she put together. Uh, a book on Gregory Goose and leadership that became a video um, for school children. And, you know, just because she was interested in that, her interests just were all over. And so she pursued everything she was interested in and nothing was gonna tie her down. And so, um, yeah, it's a shame. And in fact, when we went to the emergency room the last time, the day before Judy died, she was walking in the halls with her, with Rebecca, our daughter. And we all assumed we would we'd go home the next day. And unfortunately we didn't, but it was just, you know, she was up and moving. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, she had so many interests, but it wasn't like, oh, one day I'll do this. I'd like to do this one day. The interest that she had, she grabbed onto and she cherished and she, she, they, she 
lived them. She embodied them. I've always admired that. It's such an inspiration. So I'm, I'd love to spend a little bit of time um, with Eilish and Richard, you sharing your, uh, your experiences of the trip of Ireland. And I, I chuckled when Eilish and I were speaking to prepare for the session that Eilish was talking about all the work that Judith did during the week and Richard thought it was a vacation. So Eilish, I'm curious if you would start by sharing what was a highlight in your trip, uh, in the trip for you. Yeah, and I think Richard, it was a vacation because I took part in the vacation, but Judith also worked nonstop as well. And I know you know that, and I know you are very diligent in taking care of her with, because you remember Judith had a bag of pills and you were monitoring her because, um, Richard, I'm not sure the title is biochemist, but you have, I know she always said Richard has two PhDs. So Richard, <laughs> you were taking care of the medicine and all of that, as well as everything else. And, um, so, yeah, what fascinated me was you landed in Dublin on the 10th of September on a Sunday and Judith was ready for work on Monday afternoon because she launched the 2017 CIQ on that afternoon in the hotel. Remember, Richard, we got a taxi over. She was going to dinner to speak as a keynote that night with the Irish Institute of Training and Development. She went into a room, she chased me and Richard out because we might interrupt her in her class. And so she carried on and did the class online. Then she did the, in the dinner and she was like, she held people spellbound. They, we, they asked questions. She had the book, people were queuing up for the book. And then she went back to the hotel and Richard, you'll know this better than me. She went and did the evening class of CIQ. And I remember she just landed from the US the day before. On the Tuesday, she did the ICF conference. On the Wednesday evening, and Rosari knows a lot more about this than I do, but Rosari and myself delivered Richard and Judith in a taxi to a big event with uh, leaders, uh, a private event. It was a private dinner and it was private, exclusive. And um, on Thursday, she launched the Leadership Academy, which uh, Rosari was responsible for. And Friday, we were off to Belfast to the National Health Service where she did a, a morning workshop. We had dinner the evening before with the management team. So she was doing all of that. And at the same time, seemed to be enjoying her time together with Richard, which he can talk about. And then we traveled back on the train, Richard, if you remember, and we had a lovely time. And then Saturday and Sunday, we went touring. So for me, I think, I've lost track of the question, but it might have been what was it? So, <laughs> and that's Irish, you know, I'm Irish. Um, what I want to tell everybody here, because I loved Judith, she was a guru. You know what I mean? G U R U. You're not, you are who you are. And in all, all those times I spent, whether, whether it was at Newgrange, whether it was at in Trinity College, wherever. She was so real. I sat and I looked at her and I, I said, we are one here because we're so connected. There's nothing, no barrier between us and our conversation. And that's how she conversed with everyone all the time. And that just fascinated me. And for me, that's the abiding memory of Judith and her mission. And Richard, you alluded to it about you know, that she didn't look at her illness. But the thing is that um, she was sick and she wanted to get conversational intelligence out to the world. And I think those of us in the European CIQ feel that we have a responsibility for that. And when we wrote the book, even though it's all about different things happening in organizations, but the, the seeds that it's based on is conversational intelligence. So that is that, and I, you know, myself and Edward, my son met Judith and everyone um, loved Judith, just loved her. Mm. Richard, what was, uh, what are you remembering from that trip? Oh, the, trip? I, the truth of it is, um, Judy, liked, Judy liked to work. I mean, she just loved doing what she did. So anytime we traveled uh, was a vacation. 
because there was never really time for vacation because Judy was always creating something or doing this or doing that. So whether it was in Dubai or whether we were in China or whether we were down in Buenos Aires, you know, there was always time to do a tango or, you know, look at something else. And, and so Ireland, Ireland was no different. We stayed at this um, wonderful hotel. It was a grand hotel in Malahide, I think it was. And, and what you don't know is Judith loved breakfasts. And in the United States, they kind of call them truck driver breakfasts. But Judith, the Jewish term is kinahara, but Judith could eat, and especially breakfasts. And, and we went to the Malab at, the, at this grand hotel. They had this wonderful buffet in the morning. And so Judith was always eager to go down. You know, this is great. Let's go. Are you ready, Richard? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So, and the other thing was, um, we had come back, and there's an area in Dublin where all the, all the little bars and restaurants are. I don't know the name of it. Temple and, Bar, is it? Barbie? Maybe Temple Bar, was it? Oh, okay. And, and there was this all-Ireland Gaelic, I wrote this down, all-Ireland Gaelic football final between Dublin and County Mayo, I think it was. And we're in this, we're in this bar watching the game on TV. And there's people in the same bar between Mayo and Dublin. And I'm saying to myself, at the end of this game, there's going to be a fight. I can see it, which didn't happen. I was really surprised by that. But Judy was so excited because AIG, one of our longest clients ever, had sponsored the Dublin team. Dublin won, won nothing. They had sponsored the Dublin team and they had shirts that said AIG on them. And Judy was taking pictures of everybody with AIG on the shirt. And when we got back to the United States, she had a meeting with the CEO of AIG and showed him all the pictures. And I said to Judy, I'm quite sure he has no idea they sponsored that team. She said he knows now, but that was so exciting for Judy. Um, the other thing was when we met the New Grange um, with Edward, um, Ailish's son, and Ailish, um, Judy had been on an archaeological dig in, um, in Czechoslovakia. As I said, she, she thought she was an anthropologist. And um, we went to New Grange, which is, a, which is very impressive. Um, you know, it's a huge prayer burial mound. I mean, you know, we go through this little tunnel and we're in, there's groups of people waiting to get in and each one has a guide. And we're in the midst of this, of this, um, this huge tomb and it's covered in grass and it's immense. And we're in the midst of this, this thing underneath everything. And, and Judah starts to talk to the, the guide and they start to talk about her, her dig and this dig, this neoliberal dig, and they talk. And, and they just, all of a sudden, the tour stops and they're talking and talking and talking and talking. And one of the guides runs up and says, there's a big backup here. You guys gotta move your group, you know? And, and it was just, um, so Judith had these, Judy had these great interests. Um, and I think all of that fed in the conversation intelligence and you know all of those it's like everything you do your life your life experiences bring you into coaching or consulting your life experiences help you move forward and i think all of that combined to you know to create conversational intelligence through as i said starting out with creating we and then dna of leadership and uh, and conversational intelligence, and Judith wanted to write another book. And it's interesting, I'll just mention, we're running a foundations program now with Uda and Maria and uh, Deborah. And conversational intelligence, because of you, but really because of Uda and Deborah and Maria, at least in my contact, really changes because you all bring your own thoughts, your own actions, 
your own experiences to make it grow and grow and grow. And I think that's what separates conversational intelligence from training programs. Training programs are training programs. And in fact, as I said, I don't know if I said it, I'll repeat it. But the reason why we had all these tools, and Croft thought we had a training program. And training programs need tools, right? And, and really, you've all embodied conversational intelligence. It becomes a way of your life. It's a way you can fall. And so it's not a training program. It's alive. It's something that lives with, in you all, and you change it all. You know, you take it, create it, and move it, and then you share what you all learn, which helps everybody else make it grow and grow and grow. And I'm only sorry that Judy's not here to see how it's grown and the importance of conversation. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yes, yes, yes. It, it, we, we embody, conversational intelligence is not a study. It's a way of being, it's a way of living. And I feel so incredibly grateful that I have, I stumbled upon conversational intelligence and Judith may be physically gone, but her spirit, her wisdom, and her body of work still lives on. Uh, as far as her spirit goes and, and her wisdom, I feel so incredibly grateful to be part of the CIQ community. I consider them the, the European collective, my family. And the, we are, we are truly together because of the golden thread, the connection that Judith was. I, I am so pleased that I'm seeing people on the screen today that I know through the, the European Collective and people that I've never seen before. I think that there are about 700 of us um, that are worldwide um, certified in CIQ. And oh, yeah. I... Oh, thank you, Richard. 800. And um, her and Judith's legacy will live on as we continue to embody conversational intelligence. So I'm curious now, we do have a couple of minutes. I would be very curious for people to write in the chat box what, what tools are still close to you? What tools do you still love to use with your clients, with your family, with yourself? And we also do have um, some time if some, for some voices, if people would like to share some of the reflections that you, that you hold dear for, about Judith and about CIQ. And you could either raise your hand or write in the chat box, whatever works for y'all. And uh, while that's happening, Deborah, if I could say Ute posted there that we have some people from the new course online, which I'd be fascinated. They hadn't met Judith, but I'd be fascinated to understand if they were willing, what the, it's like using her work, you know, and she's not present to them, you know. Mm. I may add something. I'm I'm one of those who, who was were part of the first uh, foundations course. Yes, I'm, I'm deeply impressed by the conversations you are having um, during this uh, session here and sharing all your experiences. And um, yeah, I have to admit, um, taking part in this foundations course um, really changed my life. So I'm um, becoming aware of things I may have used beforehand and um, realizing on a daily basis that I make use of them and I started implementing them in my personal and professional life. So I'm happy that I started the journey and thank you for sharing everything. So nice to meet you, Katrin. Thank you for sharing with us. Who else would like to say a few words um, about how CIQ or Judith touched them? Yes, Tanya. Tanya, then Barb. Yeah, I'd uh, just like to um, really voice that, um, I know I've said it before, but it hasn't changed in any way. But uh, when I encountered conversational intelligence, my whole view, my whole perspective of the world and those around me shifted completely. It was uh, really the biggest game changer for me in my life, really. Uh, the world was a different place afterwards, is all I can say. As soon as... Uh, I started to immerse myself in the whole approach and the whole mindset of what it is. It was 
the world was a different place and it's remained that way or, or expanded more and more. Let's say the world has just grown constantly from that point. Mm, beautifully said. Barb. Okay, well, gosh, my mind is just flooded with so many special memories and seeing all of you. I really feel emotional again, um, thinking about this. A couple of memories that come to mind were um, the graduation in New York where we all ended up in song and that, that was just such a powerful connection that we were all aligned with Judas thought and principles and living CIQ. And then um, Ute, the day we were in New York and got to work at your apartment, Richard, see all of Judas' beautiful artwork and co-create together. Uh, I remember we walked to lunch. I, just all of that is um, etched in my mind and coming right back to me as present. And the only downside, if I could speak quite honestly about CIQ and conversational intelligence, is that um, in sharing it with my daughters, at times when I'm with my family and I forget some of my conversational intelligence, they're the first to say, mom, you're not sounding so conversationally intelligent. That's the only downside. Uh, I, I, if I may reframe that, Barb. Oh, I please. Think, I think <laughs> I'm gonna see them next week. So what, could, what, what about that, Deborah? I think it is absolutely wonderful that they 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 remind you that you are not acting in your integrity and as as they are used to you acting because it sounds like sometimes as we know we get a little bit narrow minded or short sighted who knows what kind of stuff is going through your mind but that you have a relationship with your children that they can call you out on it so you can widen your lens and you can re-engage with them in a loving and an understanding in a curious way i would want that with my family and friends to be reminded of that i think that you're blessed well thank you for that my one last thing my husband my work with uh, with Judith for Judith was tremendously satisfying and life changing. And one day I got a note from him and he said, I only hope I can make you smile as much as Judith Glazer does. <laughs> yeah, that's he, cool. he, he has a he has a good, so, you know, cheeky way of bringing me back. So mm. and I hope I hope uh, Uta, you're watching the chat now. That's Sheila from Ireland is maybe going to jump on your course. So that's cool, isn't it? And um, yeah. And Richard, I just want to say, you know, we're all talking about Judith, but you are such a support to Judith. I mean, I witnessed it for eight days in Ireland. It was unbelievable. And you did it so quietly and in the background. But uh, for me, you're also a star of the show, a big star. Well, not, not quite, but thank you. I'll go on now. <laughs> <laughs> we you know, know that every did. great woman is a great man. Isn't that true, Ailish? Yeah. Well, you know what Ailish never mentioned? When we were in Ireland, our search for martinis. <laughs> <laughs> and the and glass. Was, the glass. Yeah, and it was amazing how many bars didn't make martinis. <laughs> They're also, they also tend to be very short on the pores, huh, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Richard needed a martini glass and they kept giving him, you know, the new champagne flute, those ones, you know, yeah. not the flutes, the, it's like a cup. And Richard was highly disgusted, weren't you, Richard? <laughs> I, told, I told him if you make a martini in a, in a cordial glass like that, you have to put an umbrella in it. <laughs> well, as we get to the top of our hour, since Richard just said umbrella, I would like to reflect that Katarina had said when she um, asked about tools that you still use, Katarina had said uh, um, standing under someone's reality, understanding. And since there's so many of us who were in Sweden together, um, I wanted to acknowledge um, verbally that Katarina and Karina bought us all umbrellas. And we have a couple of great pictures of all of us standing under the umbrellas saying, listen to understand. And so I did want to call that out. And I do want to thank both Ailish and Richard for giving so much of your hearts during this hour. And for Tanya for, for hosting us, being the tech host and making sure that everything ran smoothly. 
Um, and I wanted to remind anybody who's not part of the European Collective that I am a member as are 27 others, and we represent diverse perspectives and cultures and experiences in, on four continents at this moment. And we are able to bring so much to the world because of how we co-create our relationship and how we listen to understand each other's perspectives. And if you like this session, we do a regulars table on the third Thursday of the month to go deeper into each of the each of the chapters of Changing Conversations for a Changing World. Um, next month on Wednesday, December 15th, Marion Bourne will talk about her chapter, which is titled, Stress Never Killed Anyone, Did It? So you can buy the book, you can, um, at, at Amazon, you can sign up for our future regulars tables. You can listen to a recording of an interview that three of the authors did with our publisher, Cheryl Benton. And Tanya has kindly put all of that into our chat box today. And I thank you so much. Um, I don't know, you know, it's a little bit early here in New York, it's one o'clock, but if anybody would like to raise a glass of water, champagne, martini, just to acknowledge the, so the golden thread that brings us all together because of the amazing Judith E. Glazer. Thank you all so much for joining us. Cheers. <laughs>